It was the German diplomat, the great businessman and politician, big influential guy, you might have heard of him, named Otto von Bismarck, who was widely credited to be the one to say, you know, any fool can learn from their own mistakes. The wise man learns from the mistakes of others. He's basically saying, you know what, anybody learns from their own mistakes. If given enough time, eventually you're going to learn. You're going to learn your lesson just by your own mistakes. And we found that to be true. The things that have taught us in our lives generally, most profoundly, are the mistakes we've made in the past. You know what, failure is a great teacher. Uh, But Bismarck wants us to understand something, and I've seen this to be true in my own life, that it's one thing to learn from your own mistakes, but it's wisdom to learn from the mistakes of others. He's basically saying you don't have to experience it to, to learn from it. You don't have to have to go through it to learn from their experience. That I don't have to go through bankruptcy to learn what leads to bankruptcy. I can see examples of that and I can apply it to my life. I don't have to have an affair to know what that does to a, a, a household, what that does to a, a, a marriage, what that does to kids. I don't have to have an affair. I don't have to, to, to do that to know what that does to my own soul. I don't have to do that to know that that never pans out well. I can learn from others' experience. You know, I don't have to have emotional burnout to know that I need to manage my outputs and my inputs and be careful about my schedule and my commitments. I don't have to bottom out and burn out. I can learn from it. I've seen other people go through that. See, it's wisdom to learn and look at other people's experiences. I don't have to bet against Tom Brady to know you don't bet against Tom Brady. (laughs) Right? Any Patriots fans? Yes? May the Lord grant us favor today. I don't think God cares, but it's all right. I don't, I don't have to be a sorry, upset Leafs fan to know you shouldn't root for the Leafs. You're going to be disappointed, <laughs> right? Oh, wow, wow. We got a lot of emotional Leafs fans, a little, little, little sensitive. That's what happens from being punished for 35, 40 years. But. <laughs> The point is this, you don't have to go through something to learn from it, that you can look at other people's lives. And and I think what happens here in Genesis chapter 4 is a prime example. This is the first story that takes place after Genesis chapter 3, where we see the fall of man, we see sin enter the world. And if you were with us last week, uh, we we journeyed through that and saw how sin came came about and some of the repercussions of that. And now the Bible sets the story right behind it. And, And something you need to understand about the Bible is what it decides to include, it's there for a reason and for a purpose. And so it's trying to show us something to teach us a truth, a lesson about how things work and how it works to live before God and what unlocks blessing versus what unlocks a life of rejection. And you see this kind of downward spiral happen with this man, Cain. You see God reject him and you see this, this kind of turn of events happen where he's, he's downcast and rejected and then it goes from that to, and we don't know how much time passes, but one day he actually takes out his vengeance and his anger and his disappointment on his own brother and, and, and kills him. It's, it's interesting to note how fast sin has degraded humanity. And the Bible wants you to see that. That's what sin does. Sin, it results in this decay, this downward spiral. And you're going to find as we journey through Genesis that things just keep getting darker and darker and sicker and sicker because of sin. And so we see that and we see this happen in this tragic story about Cain and Abel. And I want to ask the question today, what was it that was so different that Cain did from what Abel did? Because if we read it, I mean, what happened? Two guys did the same thing. The Bible says that Cain, he was a farmer. He brought some of his crops at harvest time. He decided, okay, I got to bring an offering to God. I'm going to present it to God. He's obviously a God-fearing man, and he realized I need to do this, so he took some of his crops, and he, and he offered it before God as an offering. He did a religious-type thing, but it also says that Abel did that as well, and he brought an offering. They both did it. In fact, Cain did it first. It was Cain's idea, and yet the Bible says two men who did the same thing to the same God, experienced two vastly different realities. One man was blessed. Abel was blessed. The Bible says that Abel's offering was accepted. It was blessed. God showed his favor and his kindness on Abel, but it says that Cain's offering was rejected. It was not accepted. What was the difference between what Abel and Cain did? Why was Abel accepted and Cain rejected. Have you ever felt like God rejected you? 
I know you wouldn't use those words. You wouldn't put it in that language, but bear with me. Have you ever, ever been at a point in your life, like maybe you've been coming to church for a while, maybe when you first started coming four or five years ago, uh, you came with a girlfriend and you guys both decided, decided to start coming to church and, and, and something happened where you were enjoying it, but your, your friend was actually receiving a lot more. It was like you're sitting in the same sermon in the same service, at the same church, around the same people, with the same opportunities, with the same God. And yet for her, her life is changing and you can see it and you know it's legitimate. You know it's real and you're like, wow, I want what you have. But for you, you're sitting there and you're like, yeah, this isn't working for me. Not to, not to that degree. Have you ever, you ever felt like that? Like, let's just be honest with church. Have you ever looked at someone else's experience with God and said, why, when they do it, why does it seem to work so much better than when I do it? Why, when they pray, does it seem like it just seems, it seems to have a, a punch to it and it seems like God answers their prayers? And why is it when I pray, it seems like I'm just in the waiting? Why does that happen? Have you ever felt like God's rejecting your approach and your offering? I want to ask this question, why is it? What causes the difference? How can we do the same thing to the same God and experience such different results? How can two families attend the same church and one family is clearly, when you look at them, and this doesn't mean financial necessarily, but when you look at them, they're clearly blessed by God. And the other family, they're just hanging on by a thread. They go to the same church with the same sermons, with the same people, and the same opportunities in the same neighborhood, how is it that God accepts some and rejects others? That's a tough question, and that is the question, that is the picture that Genesis 4 paints right here, and it wants to show us the way that we approach God that unlocks blessing and the way that we approach God that unlocks curse. And it's the first story that the Bible includes here. Now, there's a bunch of things we could talk about with this. We could look at, you know, how sin degrades and how it affects human culture. If we read on in Genesis 4, you actually see that the genealogy starts to pan out and it goes down to one of, uh, it goes down to Cain's son, Lamech, and Lamech's an even worse person than Cain, and it's nasty. We could talk about that. We could spend some time answering questions that the Bible is in no hurry to answer. Like, did anybody catch the fact that Cain was scared of people? Who are the people? Anybody think of that? Okay, there's Adam, Eve, Cain, Abel, and now he's scared that he's going to get killed. Well, how'd that happen? Right? Let me, let me just help you for a second. I'm not going to spend time. There are actually some cool theories on that. But if the Bible doesn't include information, it's not the point. The Bible wants us to see a deeper point here, and I believe it's trying to show us the heart that God wants to bless. And this sets up the, pl the play throughout the rest of the Old Testament and into the New Testament. What is the type of heart that God blesses? What, does it, what do you have to do to be accepted by God? That's the question. What does God bless? This is the question I want to ask. Now, fortunately, the Bible is entirely connected. That it's not a bunch of stories, it's one story. It's a story about redemption in Jesus. It's a story of creation, uh, desecration, recreation in Jesus Christ. That's the story. And, and it talks about itself and it connects. And actually there's a place in the Bible in the New Testament that talks about this story of Cain and Abel in Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11 actually references it right out. And it'll give us a window to look. I want to examine Cain and Abel and I want to ask the question, what does God bless? Anybody want to live in God's blessing? I'll take some of that, right? Let's ask this question. Let's look at it. And I think we're going to unlock some things. But Hebrews helps us understand uh, a, a certain lens. It gives us a certain lens to, as we look at it. I want to read this to you. Let's read it. Hebrews 11. I want, you, I want you to see this. It says, faith shows the reality of what we hope for. It's the evidence of things that we cannot see. Through their faith, the people in days of old earned a good reputation by faith, we understand that the entire universe was formed at God's command, that we now see did not come from anything that can be seen. We talked about that in week one, that God creates by his word. Yes. Thank you, Debbie. You're the best. <laughs> yeah, go back and re watch that one. All right. God creates by his word. Verse four. Here it is. It was by faith that Abel brought a more acceptable offering to God than Cain did. Abel's offering gave evidence, that's huge, just remember that, underline that circle. Abel's offering gave evidence that he 
was a righteous man, that his heart was in a certain place. And God showed his approval of his gifts. Although Abel is long dead, he still speaks to us by his example of faith. If you skip down to verse 6, it adds another clue. It says, and it is impossible to please God without faith. Anyone who wants to come to him must believe that God exists. That's, that's part of it. And I think we would say that Cain and Abel both believe that God exists. But there's a second part of the taxes here. And this is huge. You have to believe that God exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. I want to talk about this for a second. Let's just break this down. Let's get a lens on Cain and Abel and why Cain was rejected and Abel was accepted. Why was one blessed and the other wasn't? Well, this says it was because of this thing called faith. That essentially, Abel had faith, Cain did not. That Abel's faith, it says, showed, it provided evidence that he was a righteous man. So it's saying two things. First and foremost, faith is something that is unseen. Let's teach for a second here. You can't see faith. Faith is a heart level thing. Faith is something that God sees. Faith is something you can, you can have the appearance of faith. You can do things that look like faith. You can both give an offering. You can both go to church. You can both sing. You can both serve. You can both do those things. But faith at the end of the day comes down to a position of the heart. Faith at the end of the day is something that is unseen, that only God sees. So there's a heart level component, but the Hebrew author also says this, and don't miss it. It's a heart level component, faith is, however, it's tangible. He's saying that when you look closer at what Abel did versus what Cain did, you can see it's evident that he had a type of faith that was pleasing to God, and Cain, it was evident, did not. Do you see that? Here's what you have to understand about faith. Faith is substantive. Faith is evidential. Faith is trust. Faith is tangible. Faith is not something you just talk about. Faith is not something you can fake. You either have it or you don't. It says Cain's faith was not what Abel's was. Abel had a type of faith on a heart level that was tangible. The Bible says in Psalm 6, or sorry, 1 Samuel 16, the Lord doesn't see things the way you see them. People judge by outward appearance. God looks at your heart. But the Hebrew author says, God saw the faith in Abel, and we can see the faith in Abel when we look at what he did. There's evidence. So here's the question, and I want to break it down. I want to go back to Genesis 4, and I want to look at the story. But I want to get into the heart of blessing. Why, what was so different about Abel's faith from Cain's? The Bible sets this up as a contrast for us to learn from the mistake of Cain. So I want, if you're taking notes, I want you to write these things down. This, this matters, and I think this is going to be huge if you can just bear with me here. But here is what God blesses. I want to talk about the heart that God blesses. As we look at the story in Genesis 4, here's the first observation I want to pull out, and I'll unpack it. Abel had a certain type of faith that God blessed. The first thing I want you to notice here that God blesses is that God blesses a heart that is grateful. God blesses gratitude. God blesses thanksgiving. He, he blesses a heart that is thankful, that is grateful, that is, is, it recognizes God's goodness. God blesses that. That is a posture, a disposition that God will bless when you are thankful. Look at their actions. I just want to unpack it for a second. Go back to verse 3 and then 4. Uh, it says in verse 3, when it was time for the harvest, Cain presented some of his crops the Bible doesn't put any words in there that don't need to be there. Some of his crops is a gift to the Lord. And then it says, Abel brought a gift, the best portions of the firstborn. And there's language in here, and it shows a bit of their disposition. The Bible wants you to look beyond actions and start to see attitudes. Because at first glance, you think they did the same thing. They both gave an offering. But the Bible wants you to look closer and see the evidence of faith. That one man had faith that pleased God. The other man did not. And that one man's attitude was in the right place before God. One man's was not. Now, the Bible wants you to understand something about Cain. Cain was a farmer, just like his father before him. Cain worked the, worked the soil, worked the ground. And it, it stresses that Cain brought some of his crops. And it wants you to see a bit of an attitude that Cain has. 
Cain's attitude towards the, the stuff that God had provided towards his crops, his attitude was this. I tilled the soil. I sowed the seed. I worked the ground. I picked the fruit. I trimmed and I, I, I did the weeding and I did the, 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 the pruning. I did this. I did this. Cain's attitude toward God was that I did this, but I better acknowledge God so that he's still good to me. The attitude here that Cain has is an attitude of obligation. I believe God. I believe in God. This isn't an issue of belief. This is an issue. This is something deeper here. I believe in God. And so when he harvested his crop, he wanted to recognize God, but it was out of an obligation. And now it contrasts Cain with Abel. And you see Abel here, and it says that Abel gave the firstborn. That gives us a window into Abel's mind. It gives us a window into his heart that Abel had this kind of inclination. As soon as he saw the firstborn lamb come out, as soon as he saw the, the, the fruitfulness of what was being produced in his herd, his thought, his first thought from the firstborn, from the first fruit of his labor or God's was this, that you did this, God that this would not have happened. When I look at what's going on in my life, when I look at this herd, and when I look at the fruitfulness, and I look at these lambs, I I, I am first and foremost not led to think of all the hard work I did to get to this point. My first inclination is this. You have been good to me. You did this. It was you. There's this attitude that God blesses in us when we recognize, when we recognize his handiwork, it's, it's the difference between, between realizing that, you know what, I worked really, really, really hard to get to where I am. That might be true, but the heart that God blesses realizes that God actually gave you the tools and the resources and the mind to get to where you are. It's like the, it's like the surgeon, it's like my surgeon friend who realizes, yes, I'm smart, yes, I've worked hard, yes, I have a gift, but God gave me those things. God gave me those things. God put those in me. I could have been born any way. It's the person who has a posture and a disposition before God that says, God, you made me like this. You gave me these opportunities. You gave me these gifts. You gave me this mind. You gave me this family. You gave me this house. You gave me this job. God, this was all you. You see, God blessed Abel because his heart was not obligation towards God. It was adoration. It was thanksgiving. It was, God, you have been so good to me. And you've got to get this principle. This is in the Bible. God cannot resist the heart that is grateful. The Bible actually says this is what enters us into his presence. Did you know that? Psalm 100 says if you want to get into God's presence, if you want to get into his gates, if you want to enter his space, I mean, you want to talk about blessing and grace, go to the source. If you want to get into the presence of God, the Bible says here's the way. Thanksgiving, praise. When we praise, when we say thank you, when we have a heart of gratitude, it ushers us into a posture and a position to receive God's blessing. It's not so unlike our own, you know, those of you who have kids. When your child is entitled and bratty, when you do something for your child and they don't recognize what you have done for them, what is your attitude towards them? You stupid little punk. I'm going to teach you, right? <laughs> Isn't that it? Like when my, when my kids, like sometimes when, when my, I always do this, whenever my kids get, they get thrown around my room a little too much, I go, oh, you mean my room? You mean my room that I let you sleep in and my bed and my sheets. Oh, those are my toys too. Did you know that? Like, that's where I go. Now, God is not petty like me. (laughs) But there is a principle here. There is a disposition and a posture that we have before God that God as a father loves to bless. It's that I woke up this morning, and was everything perfect in my life? No, but I, I started by looking at what God has done for me. I reminded myself that I have a home. I have heat in the winter. I have a roof over my head. I have friends and family. I have a beautiful wife. I have kids. God, you have been good to me. You start with God's goodness. You start with adoration. See, Cain was rejected because he started with himself. He started with himself. If you want to experience more of God's blessing, here this is. You can write this down. If you want to experience more of God's blessing in your life, 
the place to start is by seeing all the ways he's already blessed you. It's not for asking for more, it's for thanking him for what he's already done. That's where it begins. The heart that God loves to bless is one that looks, that makes a practice of looking around their life and saying, God, everywhere I look, I see your handiwork. Everywhere I look, even the things that I've worked at, even the places that I've cultivated, God, you've given me the hands to do it. You've given me the mind to do it. God, you have been good to me. Anybody, think, anybody thankful for how God has been good to them? Anybody realize that God, if it wasn't for him, you wouldn't have what you have? There's such a false, a twisted lie in our culture that says, you know what, you get, you get what only you earn. You get out and earn it. And you know what, I'm all for hard work and so is the Bible. I'm all for diligence and stewardship. The Bible is too, but not at the point at which you don't recognize that, you know what, God gave you everything you have. If you want to see more of God's blessing, start by seeing more of God's blessing. Number two, let's, let's keep going. So Abel's faith is blessed, first and foremost, because you see gratitude in the text. I want to look at it a little little deeper. God also blesses, number two, if you're writing this down, you talk about the heart that God blesses, you look at Abel's faith. God blesses sacrifice. God blesses sacrifice. God blesses a sacrificial heart. Faith always looks like sacrifice. Sacrifice is the cost of faith. Sacrifice is the space of faith. It's the, it's the going without. It's the gap of faith. That's what sacrifice is. Sacrifice is you clearing out space and saying, here's how much I trust you. That's what sacrifice is. Look, look, look at the text. It says in verse 3, when it was time for harvest, Cain presented, can you say it out loud? Some. Some of his crops as a gift to the Lord. We don't know which. We don't know which ones, just, it just says a general smattering. But it says, Abel also brought a gift, say it out loud, the best portions. Abel brought the best portions. So Cain brings, you know what, maybe it was middle range, maybe it was even just the leftovers. Maybe he'd already collected all of his crop, and then he just grabbed some and didn't really give it a whole lot of thought, didn't give it a whole lot of intentionality. He just got what he needed to and brought it before God. But it's, it's clear to say this, that Abel, when he looked at the crop, when he looked at the harvest or, or the, the new herd, he looked at it and he saw the best and he brought his best to God. And that shows a level of sacrifice, sacrificial faith. Why? Because he's saying, God, here's how much I trust you. I trust you with my best. I trust you with my first. I am trusting you with this much. That's the difference here. You see, faith is sacrificial. Faith is sacrificial. It costs us something. Faith that God blesses, there's always a gap of sacrifice. If you want to see God bless you abundantly, I guarantee you it's going to come on the other side of you putting forward sacrificial faith. Now, we have a saying around here. We said it a couple of years ago when we launched our, our Move Vision campaign, for those of you who weren't here, where we said, you know what? God's calling us to plant churches, and we're going to raise money, and we're going to do this. And one of the things we said is this, the, the bigger the sacrifice, the bigger the fire. You know what? The bigger the sacrifice, the more we put down, the more God blesses it. And it's a biblical fact. And I've seen it in my own life. I've seen it in our own church. You know, the whole reason we started the Move Vision campaign was because, you know what, the window of faith and sacrifice in our church was closing. As God was blessing us, we were growing in number. Uh, we, had, we, we had the capacity to answer all of our own problems. We had enough money to pay the bills finally, and we were doing just fine. And I was getting uncomfortable with that. Why? Because there was no space in our whole ministry for faith. Where are you believing God for something? See, God blesses that kind of faith, the the kind of faith that says, here is where I'm believing God for. You know what? The kind that looks at your wealth, you know, looks at your resources and says, you know what? When I think about my life, I think of God first, and this is how much I trust him. It's sacrificial. It's sacrificial. There There is a space, a gap that God wants to bless, but you can't get there until you put in. God blesses sacrificial faith, your faith. There's this, there's this uh, story in the New Testament where Jesus comes up upon these two blind men. And these blind men stop Jesus. And, and Jesus says to them, it's in Matthew 9, he says, uh, what do you want me to do for you? Which is like, thanks. You can't see? I can't see you, man. Like, like obvious. 
What do you want me to do for you? But Jesus wants them to verbalize it. He says, what do you want me to do for you? They say, we want, we, want, we want to see. And Jesus says in Matthew 9, he says, do you believe that I'm able to do this? Do you have faith? They said, yes. And then he touched their eyes and said, according to your faith, be it done to you. You see that? Listen, your current experience of the blessing of God is currently according to your faith. Did you know that? Like to the degree that you are exercising faith right now in your life is the degree that you're experiencing the blessing of God, period. It's not on God to have faith for you. It's on you to have faith for you. So my question would be this, where are the spaces in your life where you are fighting for faith, where you are carving out space saying, God, you, I want your blessing more than I want that blessing. Where is it? Because God blesses sacrifice. Isn't this a fun message? <laughs> now think about this. I just want to help you. Like, like some, because sometimes we get confused why God isn't blessing me, but I, I get a great vantage point on our community. I, I see so many families and so many different people approach, like trying to, to live the life of faith. And, and I'll tell you what, there is a way of faith that God blesses. I've seen it. This isn't just in the Bible. This isn't some Bible fairy tale. I've seen it played out. Like I, I've seen family A with six kids who get up every week and they say, you know what? There's all kinds of things that we could do, but we're fighting the fight of faith and we're carving out time to say, you know, there's sometimes we can't make it to church, but by and large, we're going to be there every week. And so I've, there, you know, we've got the mom who, she's a single mom and she fights three kids to get to church and she gets up and she says, you get in the car, get in the car right now, buckle yourself up. And she fights the whole way there. And then she's got two kids, bouncing two kids while she's a red shirt. Welcome to King's Church, right? Like the kids barfing on her. She's <laughs> fighting the fight of faith. It costs her something. She's putting in, she's investing herself. You know what? God blesses that. But it's never those people that come to me wondering where God's at. It's always the people who give God their leftovers that come to me and say, why is God not blessing me? It's the people who, they'll come to church once every six or eight weeks if something better didn't come up. Am I getting too real? It's the people who give God their leftovers and their last, who don't fight for it, who, who don't create any space in their life to say, God, you matter to me. You're of first importance. I trust you more than I trust my money. I trust you more. I, I need you to bless my time. That's why I give you a day every week and say, God, the first day of my week, that goes to you because I need you to bless the rest. You see, you have to fight for that space. And when you fight for that space and you carve it out and say, God, bless me, God does it. But don't be surprised if God's not blessing your life when you aren't doing anything to allow him to bless it. Here's something I know to be true in my own life, and I've seen it in yours. God cannot bless what you won't give him. God can't bless what you won't give him. You're crying out to God to bless your finances, but you haven't once trusted him with them at all. You want God to bless your marriage, but you haven't done the work as a marriage to come before God and say, God, we need your blessing. God can't bless what you won't give him. See, Abel was blessed because he brought the best he, he recognized that if God doesn't bless me, I'm sunk. He understood that God blesses sacrifice. Now, some of you think I'm being too harsh. I'm trying to help you. You understand? Like I'm, I, listen, if you, if you leave this place and you're like, well, super mom bounces babies, so I better go and be a red shirt, you aren't, you aren't hearing me. I don't want something from you. We, don't need, we, you know, we, we do need more red shirts, but that's not what I want you to, you know, like I, I don't need you to start giving. God provides. You need you to start giving. That's the difference. See, see, Cain thought he was tricking God. That's the tragedy here. He thought he was like pulling one over on God. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to sneak my, my leftovers in for an offering. See, he's, it's, like, it's like that, uh, that saying, you know, like you're, you're only cheating yourself. See, that's what's happening. There's this thing inside us that says, okay, I'm gonna do the bare minimum before God so that God, I'm on God's good side. But God's like, no, I, I wanna bless whatever you give me. So there should be incentive to give him your best. All right, let's move on. I'll, I'll loop back around to that. Are you with me? You're all like, man, I didn't wanna come and get beat up at church. Like, <laughs> uh, I, I promise you, I promise you, have good news. But you gotta, you gotta get this stuff. There's a reason why some of you aren't growing in your faith. There's a reason why you're not experiencing God's blessing, and it's not rocket science. It's, it's right here in the Bible. There is a way unto blessing that God flat out will. He actually, it actually gets clearer right here. Let me, let me keep going. It says number three. Here's, here's number three if you're taking notes. Here's the heart that God blesses. 
God, and this is closely connected to, the, to sacrifice, God blesses obedience. Doesn't it feel like you just sat down in the living room and dad had a talk with you? Like, talking obedience, talking sacrifice, talking be thankful. You know what? This is true. God blesses obedience. Look, 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 look closer again. Look, look back at verse four. It says, it says that Abel brought a gift. Now, we know that Cain brought some of his crop, right? But it says Abel brought the best portions of the firstborn. Now, this is the first place that we see uh, the tithe. The tithe is a, is a term you find in the, in the Bible about the, a tenth. It means a tenth. It means recognizing God with a tenth of what you have. And this isn't a message on tithing, but this, is a, this, is, this shows a level of obedience I want you to see here. Abel did what God asked. You can find it all through the Bible. You find it in Genesis 3. The, the, there wasn't the tithe, it was the tree. God asked them not to touch the tree. That was the test. After the tree, when, when everything broke down, when you see the rest of the Old Testament play out, it's not a tree anymore that's the test. It's the tithe that's the test. Where God says, that's sacred to me. It's mine. Don't touch it. And it's a test. So the tithe is a test. And Abel passed the test. Abel gave to God what God asked for. Cain did not give God what he asked for. God asked for the first fruits. Cain gave some of the fruits. Now, look what it says next. So God blessed Abel's obedience. He blesses obedience. It's not rocket science, but watch next what happens to Cain. This is so, this is so crucial. It actually plays it out. Verse 5 says, He did not accept Cain and his gift. This made Cain very angry, and he looked dejected. Now God speaks and says, Why? Dude, what's your problem? It's the Brent paraphrase. Why are you so angry, the Lord asked Cain. Why do you look so dejected? You'll be accepted if you do what is right. Let me paraphrase that. God's coming to Cain saying, man, what is your problem? Why are you sitting here acting like I won't bless you too? Why are you playing? Why are you acting like if you didn't do what Abel did, I wouldn't bless you like Abel was blessed? Why are you sitting here all upset with me that I treated your offering different than Abel's when Abel did what I asked and you didn't? It's really simple. And here's the thing the Bible wants you to see, and, and this just kind of can burst some of that sort of, you know, what self-focused uh, insecurity that we have before God. But here's the deal you have to understand. You know, the Bible talks about favor, but you got to get this. God really doesn't have favorites. The Bible says that God is no respecter of persons. What does that mean? It means, A, he's not impressed by who you are. He doesn't care what your last name is, doesn't care what you've accomplished, doesn't care what you come from. And B, he's also not put off by what you are. Like, he does, you know what? He doesn't care what you did, what you didn't do, what you, where you were, where you weren't were. He, where, where you weren't were. He, he doesn't care. <laughs> He does not care. He's not a respecter of persons. He's a respecter of principles. He always does what he says he's going to do. And he says, if you are obedient to me, I will bless you. And all through the Old Testament and into the New Testament, the over and over says, blesses the man who walks not in the path of the wicked or stands in the seat of sin, or sits in the seat of sinners or, or sit, stands in the way of scoffers. But on his law, he meditates day and night. He will be blessed. The Bible over and over says, obey God, be blessed. Obey God, be blessed. Do what God says, God will bless that. The Bible says it over and over. Jesus says it. Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, in, in Matthew chapter seven, at the end, he says this, blessed is the man who hears my words and puts them into practice. If you do what I said to do, God will bless you. Except all of us, so many of us, and I've seen it in my own life before, where I, 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 I'm jealous of the blessing of God on someone's life because it's not on, on me. But then when I look closer and I realize, oh, oh, God blessed them richly because they invested themselves richly. See, God will bless you the same way he blesses everybody else. There's no secret formula. There's no secret knowledge. If you obey God and honor God, 
and put God first, God will bless you. This is, this is the incentive. God blesses obedience. God blesses Abel because he did what God asked. <laughs> it seems so simple. It's really hard though, isn't it? Like on the ground, it's really hard, but you gotta, you gotta the, the, the devil wants to convince you that you aren't being blessed when you obey God. It's trying to con- he's trying to convince you that you're giving something up. Yeah, but if I do that, then I won't feel that. Or yeah, if I do that, then I won't experience this. You're giving up. But God says, no, 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 no. When you are obedient to me, you're getting, not losing. You're winning, not losing. It's a blessing, not a curse. And that's what this right here is so significant that Genesis 4 contrasts these two approaches to God. That on the one hand, you've got the one who, who, who's approaching God and they're kind of, they're, they're scared, they're, they're hoarding, they're, they're giving God their leftovers. He's, he's giving God the, the, you know, the tail end, God's his last, you know, last stitch thought. And then you've got the other approach, Abel, who's like, no, God, when I look at my life, I see all your goodness. I see your handiwork and I will obey you because you've been good to me. And the Bible wants you to see, and this is, this is the main point of this whole text, The Bible wants you to see the two vastly different perspectives on God. Two men who did the same thing to the same God, but had two vastly different versions of who God is in their mind. And that is the difference. If you're taking notes, write this down. Here's here's number four, and this is so profound. God blesses the blessed God blesses the blessed. What do I mean by that? God blesses the one who realizes they're blessed. What do I mean? It's blessing, living in the the blessing of God is not a matter of performance. Get this. Do not leave here and go get tithing envelopes to get on God's good side. Watch this. Living in the blessing of God is not a matter of performance. It's not a matter of what you do. Living in the blessing of God is not a matter of performance. It's a matter of perspective. It's about who you know. See, living in God's blessing is the fruit of a perspective you have about who God is. Abel was living in the overflow of who he believed God was. Do you see the difference? Who, who was Cain's God? Cain's God was some kind of taskmaster that I need to get off my back, I need to appease, I need to keep happy, I need to do certain things that keep him, you know, I gotta stay, stay right before him, I gotta make sure that I maneuver my life in such a way that he, he's good to me. That's Cain's God. You know what that is? That is religion. Religion is when we try to do stuff to put God at our mercy so God will bless us. But here's the deal, and here's what Genesis 4 wants you to see. God will bless you, and you don't have to manipulate him to get blessing. God only blesses. That's all he does. That's who he is. And so Genesis 4 wants you to change your perspective to how can I get God's blessing? How can I cause God to be good to me to realizing God will only ever be good to you? Do you see this? It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a perspective on God that unlocks blessing. You see, Cain, his, his vision was, God will not bless me unless I do this. Abel's perspective was, God has blessed me, so I will do this. Do you see the difference? See, Cain was a slave. He was a slave. God was a taskmaster. God was some evil CEO up in the towers of heaven that he had to keep happy. But to Abel, God was good. God was the giver of every good and perfect gift. God was a father. See, Cain was a slave. Abel was a son. And what Genesis 4 wants you to see is God makes a terrible employer. Right? Like, because Cain came, he's like, all right, pay up. I did my stuff. I'm clocking out. I was like, I don't play by those rules. You can't manipulate me. You didn't punch in with me. God makes a terrible employer. He's not playing by those rules, but he makes an amazing father. He's an awesome father. 
and he will not stop blessing his sons. You know, there's a, I was in my own time studying the book of Matthew through the fall, and I came upon a, a text, frankly, that I got it in part, but I didn't understand maybe to the degree that I do now, and God spoke something to me. Uh, there's this parable in Matthew 23 called the parable of the talents, where, where Jesus says, you know what, like, here's how you need to understand God. And God gave one person one talent, another person two talents, and another person five talents. And the one with five went off and did good before God, and God rewarded him. The one with two went off and did good before God, and God rewarded him. But the one with one actually was scared of God, and he buried the talent, and God actually, like, just like, you know, curses him and says, you're a wicked servant. Why would you do that? And then Jesus says these words at the end of it. And it always used to jar me because it just, it hurt my sense of what everything that's right in this world. He said in Matthew 25, verse 29, Jesus says, for to everyone who has, more will be given. And he will have an abundance. Just keep flowing. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. And I remember, I remember so many times growing up reading that, thinking, well, that's not fair. I mean, I get the whole, like, do good with my life before God. I get that. I'm going to take all my talents, and I'm going to produce a return to keep you happy. But I missed the whole heart of what Jesus was saying. He's saying to the one who has, they'll be given more. To the one who has not, even that will be taken away. And Jesus is trying to get you to see that life before God is a matter of posture, It's disposition. It's perspective. You see, the one who believes they already have are postured to receive more. Do you see it? The one who believes they have not, their cup's upside down. It's turned upside down. I'm not going to get more. In fact, what I had there is going to leak out. Jesus is saying, when you flip your cup and you say, God, you are so good to me. You never stop being good. Every good and perfect gift comes from you. You don't have bad moods. You don't have bad days. And even in the bad days of my life, I can trust that you're still being good to me. You never stop being good to me. Every single day, you don't wake up cranky. I look at my life and I see evidence of your goodness. You see, when your cup flips over and you realize what you have been given, the Bible says you're postured to receive more, that God just keeps pouring his blessing to you. But if your attitude is not, I have been blessed, but I have not been blessed, you are in no place to receive the blessing of God. And that's what leads you to live the life of Cain. Your cup's flipped over. You can't receive. You aren't postured to receive. And so when you hear the preacher get up and say, you should tithe, it's crazy that you can trust God for your salvation and not with 10% of your money. When you hear me say that, if your cup's flipped over, you think that's a threat. If your cup is right side up before God, you realize that's an invitation for God to bless my life. See, and if that's jarring against you right now, that I would say that. That I would say you should serve in your church. You should give in your church. You should give to God. That I would say that. If that is jarring you, you have the mind of Cain that says, I can't trust God with that much money. But if you have the mind of Abel, the mind that Jesus is trying to get you to see, that God can be trusted with everything, you are postured to continue to receive not just an adequate amount. It says he will be given an abundance. This is so huge. You've got to see the shift here. It was not a matter of performance. Get this, because some of you could leave here right now and get tithing envelopes and, and, and join the red shirt team and think, well, I suck at being a Christian. That's not what this is about. It's not a matter of performance. Get this. It's a matter of perspective. It's a posture. It's a disposition. It's realizing God is good. And when you realize he's good, it frees you up. It moves you from have not to have, from slavery to sonship. Some of you are slaves. You're slaves to fear, even in your belief of God. Isn't that crazy? That you can be a slave to fear in your belief of God. That's the whole point of the parable of the two sons. Let me say this. I'm going to wrap up, but i got to hit this. You know the parable of the two sons? Most of the time we just talk about the prodigal son because we're all the prodigal son, right? Like we've all gone to a faraway land. You know what? Done some stuff we're not proud of. And by God's grace, aren't you thankful for the Father who accepts us as we are, where we are, puts a robe on us, puts the ring on our finger, and throws a party. Thank God for His grace. But, the, but Jesus actually tells about two sons. And actually the climactic part of the story isn't the prodigal son. 
it actually loops around to the older brother. And it tells us while the party's going on, the older brothers, like Cain, pouting in the field, ticked off that the father would lavishly pour grace on him. And so they have this exchange where the older brother comes to the, to the father and says, why would you do this? That's not right. He squandered what was his and now you're taken from mine. And he says, all these years, I've slaved for you. I've done the right things and this is how you repay me. You see, in his mind, that was no father at all. He was a slave master and he just, was, just experienced a gross injustice. But Jesus says this, then the father looked at him and said, son, what are you talking about? What are you talking about? Everything I have is yours. All of it. I'm not holding anything back from you. I'm not, I'm not keeping something special for real special kids. You're my special kid. Everything I have is yours. You have fridge rights. You want to sleep on the couch? Sleep on the couch. I gave you your own room. You can take the car, whatever you want. It's all yours. You didn't need to ask. Change your perspective to God is good. He's good. And when you get that revelation, when you understand, and God, would that, would that land deeper in my heart? Forgive me for the times that I live a slave to fear. I live thinking that you're, you're not good and you're not who you are. And I have the attitude of Cain that I would try to manipulate you and coerce you to get on my side when all the time you've already been on my side. The whole time God's been on your side. That's the crazy thing. We convince ourselves that God's not on our side and he's only ever always been on our side. It's up for us to go to his side. That's the story. True life true freedom, life and the blessing of God is rooted in the realization that God has been good to me. God is being good to me. God will only ever be good to me. I can trust him. That's it. That's it. It's changing from a have not to a have mentality. I obey. I have been blessed, so I obey. I obey because I'm blessed. I give. Why? Because I'm blessed. I'm thankful. Why? Because I'm blessed. I'm sacrificial. Why? Because God blesses me and has been blessing me. I'm faithful because I'm blessed. I'm bold because I'm blessed. It's a change in perspective. A change in perspective unlocks a change in experience. I, I, I realize that God is good, not bad, so it changes everything. I realize I'm loved, not rejected. I realize God is for me, not against me. I realize that I'm above, not below. I realize I'm a victor, not a victim. I realize I'm blessed, not cursed. I realize that this is my day that this is my season, that this is my life, that God has given me and God will bless me in all seasons, in all seasons. Doesn't mean that things are gonna go exactly the way I thought it was, but it means that I can trust his goodness to bring me through even the darkest valley. This is what Psalm 23 means where, where, where David says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I won't fear evil because you're with me. You prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. My cup just keeps overflowing. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. Why don't you stand with me? I gotta stop. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna go another 20 minutes here. Just get this, get this. We walk in the blessing of God by continually realizing God is good. I am loved. God can be trusted. This is one of the main points and purposes of the cross. It's not just a practical thing that Jesus did. We talked last week about how when Jesus died on the cross and rose again, what happened? It was the recreation, restoration of all things. But it also is something that God wanted to communicate to you and I, and that is this. God is good. Look at the cross. God didn't count your sins against you. Even when you were guilty, he said, my son, to you. God forgave you. God restored you. God accepted you. This is why Paul in Romans 8 said, how could he who did not spare his own son, not along with him, graciously give us all things? Listen, you just got to hear this. God is not withholding things from you. 1 John 4, 18 says it like this. There is no fear in love. But perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. Cain was afraid. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. 
We love because he first loved us. When you look at the cross and you see Jesus and you see the radical love of God, it sets you free. Let's pray. Father, thank you today. Thank you that it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Thank you that when we look at your cross, God, we see your love on display, demonstrated to us. Thank you, Lord, that you didn't hold anything back, but you already gave us the most precious commodity in all of the universe, Jesus. You, there's nothing more valuable that you could give us. So when it comes to our lives and the, 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 the things that we need and all of our needs, Lord, we thank you that you are exceedingly abundantly able to supply all that we ask or even imagine. God, we thank you for your goodness today, demonstrated to us in Jesus. I pray by your spirit for a revelation of the love of God that would remind us, I have nothing to fear. I'm loved by God. I live in the Father's house in which everything he has is mine. It's been given to us in Christ Jesus. We have been gifted with every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus. I thank you for that today. Would that rest in our hearts and resonate in our minds and transform how we live? God, would we be a people? Would we rise up as a people? Would we be the change in this region to move from a half not mentality.